And Christ is risen. Amen. What an amazing reason to come together this morning to worship. Let's just uh, bow our hearts in prayer. If there's any children, um, Sunday school, you can dismiss and go to Sunday school and um, at this time. And let's bow our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do celebrate this morning for your great love, your amazing gift. And we celebrate the fact that, yes, you died that we might live. And we celebrate the fact that we live because you rose again and you live forevermore. You are our life. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God, which gives us hope. And we pray, Lord, that you would open the understanding of our hearts and cause us this morning to rejoice in the hope we have in the resurrected Christ Jesus. And I pray that we would see that that same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us and enables us to be triumphant and victorious over those same powers that worked against you, Lord. You give us victory over them today. And I just ask for the enabling of your spirit to speak your word with clarity, with conviction. And Lord, that you would accomplish your purpose in our hearts. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we do welcome each of you this morning, and we thank the choir for uh, just leading us in worship and ministering to us in song. I'm going to take a look at uh, the resurrection of Christ, but I'm going to look at at the events around the resurrection, surrounding it, the, the context. And I'm going to draw to our attention some parallels between the, the events surrounding the resurrection of Christ and what we see in the world today, and to see how uh, the power of the resurrection was something that triumphed back then and is meant to give us victory today. The crucifixion, the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ form the core of our Christian faith and establish our foundation. And yet it took place in a particular context in history. There were many significant political, social and spiritual events that were taking place around the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that are remarkably similar to conditions that we see developing around us in our world today. And you might be tempted or succumb to uh, despair sense of hopelessness, dread, fear, when you look at, at where our world is going today. But I want you to be able to recognize that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have no reason for fear. We have no reason for despair. This morning we are going to look at the context surrounding the resurrection of Christ, and we will gain insights that I believe will be very encouraging for us today. Let's look at the spiritual, social, and political climate that Jesus and his followers were living in uh, at that first resurrection morning and trust the Lord to give us insights that will give us wisdom for living today, that will give us hope for the future, and that will remove some of that dread of the time in which we live. They lived in an environment in which there was opposition to Jesus Christ and in which the social pressure was huge against 
even talking openly about him. In John chapter 3, remember the account of Nicodemus? He was a ruler of the Jews, but he came to Jesus secretly at night. Why secretly at night? Because it would have cost him his career if it became known that he was sympathetic toward Jesus. And in John 12, verse 42, we read that even among the rulers, many believed in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Today, in our culture as well, to be open about your faith in Jesus Christ, if you are in the political realm, is political suicide. If you are in government or running for government or public office. And then John 7, verse 13. It was the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. Many were talking about Jesus, but secretly, not in the open. It says, however, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. In John 9, 22, the parents of a blind man who had been healed by Jesus refused to publicly acknowledge that it was Jesus who had performed this amazing miracle for their son because they feared the Jews for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that Jesus was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. To be put out of the synagogue was to become a, a social outcast. If you were banned from the synagogue, you would have a hard time making friends or getting a decent job. Doesn't this sound like the environment that we are sinking into today? This oppression soon led to complete censorship immediately following the, the death and resurrection of Christ. In Acts 4.17, we read, The authorities commanded the disciples not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. There is today strong censorship of any speaking or teaching in the name of Jesus in our schools, universities, workplaces, the media, and most public forums. The dominant religion in Jesus' day was Judaism, at least in that land, which had been at one time based upon the truth of God's word. But in Jesus' time, the religion had become corrupt and they abandoned the authority of God's word. And they had replaced the scriptures with the teachings and traditions of man. When you went to the synagogues, you heard more of the teachings of men than you did of the word of God. Matthew 15, verse 6 to 9, Jesus says, Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition, hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. This is an accurate description of the condition of many churches and Christian ministries today. There is a diminishing amount of authority or attention given to the word of God in many churches. If God's word clashes with humanistic evolution or with LGBT ideology, whose word do many Christians believe? The word of God or the word of man? Truth and morality were being compromised in the days of Jesus for the sake of keeping the favor and the support of the government. You see, government funding, the Roman government funding, had paid for the construction of the Jewish temple under Herod. And knowing that Roman government saw Jesus as a threat to their control, the leaders of Judaism did not want to risk losing either their temple or their favor with the government. And so they compromised the truth and they sought to silence Jesus in order to appease the government. In John 11, verse 47 and 48, the Bible says, that then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? For this man, speaking of Jesus, works many signs. 
If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place, our temple, and our nation. This totally describes the compromise that is happening in our Christian schools today. Most Christian schools in Alberta are removing or downplaying Bible doctrine, blotting out references to scripture, toning down Judeo-Christian morality. But instead, they are agreeing to accommodate government-mandated ungodly policies in order to appease the government and to maintain the funding. And it doesn't end with our schools. The same doctrinal compromise is taking place in our churches, Bible colleges, parachurch ministries, in order to maintain charitable tax status and to not risk losing our buildings. In the sequence of events surrounding the crucifixion of Christ, we see a climate in which evil is exalted and good is condemned. John the Baptist, who had called for the repentance of the corrupt leaders of Israel, was put to death by a government leader for his righteousness, while a party was thrown in celebration of that same corrupt leader. And when Jesus was put on trial, instead of upholding justice, the crowds called for the release of a murderer named Barabbas, while demanding the crucifixion of the sinless Son of God. And after crucifying him, the crowds went on to celebrate and party the Passover. Today we live in an environment in which the most innocent members of our society are being massacred by the millions in our abortion clinics every year, while their murderers are justified, protected by the government. And we pass legislation to legalize and even to celebrate those things that God's word, word calls vile and abomination. And yet any who would dare to call for repentance and any who would seek to turn others away from being drawn into such behavior are criminalized. In Jesus' day, there was a great prevalence of demonic activity. Even Satan was very much at work opposing the ministry of Jesus. And everywhere he went, there was demonic manifestations surrounding him. And Jesus was casting out demons. And today also, there is a dramatic increase of demonic activity, witchcraft, and occult practices around the world. In the early days of Jesus' ministry, he had vast multitudes of followers everywhere he went. But as he neared the time of his crucifixion and resurrection, most of the people who had followed him walked away. In John 6, the Bible says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. This parallels the phenomena we are witnessing all around us today. Many who profess to be Christian, walking away from the faith they once professed. Abandoning the faith was a characteristic of the climate in Israel surrounding the time of that first Easter. And so was the attack against key leaders to knock them out of the game. Just before his crucifixion, Jesus was abandoned by two of his key disciples who were being groomed and trained for leadership. Judas, one of the twelve, walked away and even turned against Jesus, joining the other side to help plan for his arrest and crucifixion. Even Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, and one of the strongest leaders and most outspoken of the Lord's followers was targeted by Satan, and under that spiritual pressure, he collapsed and denied even knowing Christ. In Luke 22, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. All around us today, we see spiritual leaders under attack and often walking out or being knocked out of their place of leadership, often resulting in a destabilizing or fracturing of a congregation and ministry. We have witnessed at least 
four specific occasions in the last year alone in, in our congregation in which the enemy has directly attacked the leadership of our church, seeking to bring division and scatter the congregation. And my heart is heavy over a fellow pastor who has just recently been knocked out of his church by the enemy, a godly pastor of a solid, thriving church. And I pray that the pastor is not embittered and that the church is not scattered as a result. Jesus gave this warning to his followers on the night before his crucifixion. In John 15, verse 18, he said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. I think that's enough of the, the negative. Let's look specifically at the resurrection of Christ to see what insights, what hope we can gain for today. Remember the context in which this took place. Matthew 28 and verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. They were looking for a tomb inside of which they expected to be a body, the body of Jesus Christ. But look at verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. Verse 5, but the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And verse 8, so they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. And then in John chapter 20 and verses 19 to 22, this is later that same day. Resurrection Sunday. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. People, this word is for us today too. Peace be with you. You're living in a similar environment to what they were living in there. Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. That's significant for us. As the Father has sent Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ sends us. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. That last statement is huge. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the invisible life and power of God. Receive that same almighty spirit that had just raised Jesus from the dead. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. But we've looked at some parallels 
that can be drawn between the spiritual climate, political climate, and social climate surrounding the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the climate in which we are living today, spiritually, politically, socially. And there's a lot of parallels. That was the hostile environment which led to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And it is the hostile environment in which we find ourselves sinking today. But it is important to remember these three things. First, that back then was the world into which God chose to come. And in that environment, he chose to reveal his love. It is not a hopeless environment, but an ideal environment in which to display the grace of God. I remember different times I've gone with my wife shopping for jewelry. And, <laughs> yeah, one in particular. <laughs> You go to the jewelry store and you ask, can I look at those items? And uh, first thing they do, they lay out a piece of black cloth. And then they put the jewels, jewelry on top of the cloth. There's purpose for that. It, the, the black background accentuates and brings out the, the glitter of the jewelry. It is against that black background that Jesus Christ has chosen to display his grace, his love, his power. So first of all, that is the background that God chose to bring his son into. And second, those were the powers that were at work back then, the powers of the world, the powers of sinful fallen flesh and the powers of the demonic realm that were at work back then, and it's the same powers at work today. And they could not hold Jesus Christ in the grave. They could not silence the gospel message. He rose triumphantly from the dead in the face of this opposition. There was nothing his opponents could do to stop him. And brothers and sisters, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and I. The third thing we need to remember is those were the conditions in which Jesus chose to build his church with the promise that I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 2,000 years later, we are still here. God has been faithful and the church continues to spread across the globe. God's strength is made perfect in weakness. The environment was hostile, but out of it, a spirit-filled church was born and proceeded to thrive and to spread and to boldly turn the world upside down by the power of the resurrected Christ living in them. And that same power lives in us today. Folks, our confidence and hope for the future of our kids is not in Jason Kenney. It is not in the United Conservative Party or any other political party. That is a vain hope. Our hope is in the resurrected Jesus Christ. We read in Matthew chapter 28, or we read in Matthew 28, about the resurrection of Jesus. I want you to return there with me. Matthew chapter 28. Let's read the rest of the resurrection story. Uh, beginning at verse, verse 9, Matthew 28, verse 9. And as they went, as the, the women who had discovered the, the empty tomb went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Go down to verse 16. And then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee 
to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. Because all authority has been given to me, go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All authority has been given to me, Jesus said, and I am with you to the end of the age. Go, therefore. Don't be afraid. Boldly go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. As the Father had sent Jesus into that hostile environment empowered by the Holy Spirit, Jesus sends us also into a hostile environment, but not on our own. His Holy Spirit, that same Spirit that brought Jesus from the dead, now lives in us and now empowers us, and we now go in his power. Jesus made this promise to his disciples in Acts 1 verse 8. He said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Paul understood what benefit came to believers as a result of the resurrection. And he prayed that we would come to know what God has accomplished for us as a result of the resurrection of Jesus, the Son of God. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. And let's read what Paul had to say to the Ephesian church. And it was recorded in Scripture by the Holy Spirit because it is the word of God to his church today. Ephesians 1 and verse 18. You can follow along in your translation. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Bible, which draws out and expands on the meaning of what is being said in the text. But verse 18, partway through the verse, I pray that you can know and understand the hope to which the Lord has called you. The hope. That hope is that confident expectation based on the promise of God. I pray that you can know and understand the hope to which he has called you and how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints, his set-apart ones. That's us who believe. Verse 19, And so that you can know and understand what is the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe, as demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Do you get that? His power that immeasurable, unlimited, and surpassing greatness of his power in us and for us, for our benefit, for our good, for our success in fulfilling his great commission, as demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength. When did he demonstrate his strength? When he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Verse 21, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named above every title that can be conferred, not only in this age and in this world, but also in the age and the world which are to come, including where we are today and beyond. Verse 22, And he has put all things under Christ's feet and has appointed him the universal and supreme head of the church, 
a headship exercised throughout the church, which is his body. Let's, don't miss this. What's his body? The church. The church is the body of this awesome Christ that's being described here. We are his body today, which is his body. Get this next expression. The fullness of him who fills all in all. The fullness of him who fills all in all lives in us. We are his body. The work that he began in the Gospels, he continues today through his church. For in that body lives the full measure of God who makes everything complete. You don't have a bit of God. You've got God in you. And so as we live in the context in which we find ourselves living today, the environment that is toxic around us. Let us look back to the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and recognize that it was the same back then, even worse than what we are experiencing in this land of Calgary, of Alberta. And yet, that power of God working through Jesus Christ overcame all the opposition, overcame all the obstacles, raised him from the dead, established his church in the face of tremendous opposition, and it continues. This is the power behind the bold declaration of Galatians 2.20, in which Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. We saw that Friday. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer that old me who lives. That old life is dead and gone. But Christ, but Christ lives. And he lives in me. And the life which I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Brothers and sisters, let us not be daunted. Let us not be dismayed. Let us not be cowed and intimidated. Let us be wise as serpent and innocent as doves. And let us fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. And let us run with perseverance the race that he's marked out for us in this toxic environment, yes, but fixing our eyes on the resurrected Jesus Christ and recognize he is my life. He is my strength. He is my joy. He is my peace. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And this morning, if you have never put your faith in the resurrected Jesus Christ, you are invited to do so. Jesus Christ is alive. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior. Believe in him, and you will be set free from your guilt of your sin. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for your sin when he died on the cross, and he extends forgiveness to all who will put their faith in him. And because he rose again, if you put your faith in him, you will receive his Holy Spirit. And he will come into you and he will empower you to live a whole new life. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for the hope that we have today. Lord, deliver us from fearfully looking around for some kind of security, but cause us to lift our eyes to Jesus and to recognize that you are our Savior. You are our hope. And Lord God, I pray that we would trust you for the victory. Whatever the pressures that we are facing today, may we trust in you with all our heart. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.